Jai Hind, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining today. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Defence, Government of India, Center of Joint Warfare Studies, New Delhi, Army Design Bureau, Army Quarters, Director General Perspective Planning, Indian Military Review, uh, I welcome all eminent panelists, participants to today's webinar on changing dynamics of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, thank you very much for joining and my uh, special thanks uh, indeed uh, to the former Chief of Naval Staff, uh, Admiral Arun Prakash, uh, Lieutenant General Saini, the Vice of the Army Staff, Vice Admiral Dr. Amarullah Uktemia, Rector of the Republic of Indonesia, Defence University, uh, Lieutenant Manoj Pandey, a fellow Pirate Command Commander Chief of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Command, uh, Rear Admiral Shrikan Shrikande, Association Shrikande, uh, Rear Admiral Jaswinder Singh, the Assistant Chief of Naval Staff, Air Marshal Dr. Andrew Dows, Edith Owen University of Australia, Rear Admiral Michael Dittewitt, retired US Navy Senior Fellow Center for Naval Analysis, Washington, Lieutenant P.S. Rayeshwar, former Chief of the Integrity Defense Staff and Senior Center of Naval Command, as also a former Chairman, Center of Joint Warfare Studies, and Major General Ravi Aroda, Editor of Indian Military Review and Distinguished Fellow St. George. Mm -hmm. My special thanks to all the participants, especially those from the uh, training establishments uh, who are online and in the conference halls uh, and are participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, we have two sessions today. Uh, session one, we discuss the evolving geopolitics of the Indian Ocean region. And in session two, uh, we will look at China's challenges uh, to India's interests. Uh, when I say Indian interest, I also mean the interest, uh, convergence of interest uh, of the Indian Ocean region nations. Uh, there can be no doubt that China and COVID-19 have been the biggest disruptors uh, of not only this century, but in the, really, uh, the last century also, uh, which has impacted the behavior of individuals, society, people, nations, region, and the emerging world order. India's national aim is to transform India into a modern, prosperous, and a secure nation. Peace and stability is imperative to long-term economic development. India faces multiple challenges in its quest to ensure the well-being of its 1.38 billion people. However, responsible, risen, resurgent, and resilient India realizes that this is best achieved by inclusive security and growth of the region. Uh, our Prime Minister Samadhi stated Sagar, which is security and growth for all in the region, as the vision and the goal. Uh, India's land borders extend 1,000 15,106.7 kilometers with seven nations, including Afghanistan. Uh, we also have a 7,516.6 kilometer of coastline uh, with the total of 1208 islands and the exclusive economic zone of 2.37 lakh square kilometers. And hence, peace and stability in the Indian Ocean region is an imperative for India's and the region's economy and security as both are interlinked. India is a global leader and as the balance of power shifts from west to east, India and the region should be future ready to play a vital role in the community of nations. The emerging world order likely will be dictated by the balance of power equations. However, India will need to ensure a fine balance between the balance of power and the balance of interest. Our national interests uh, have to be factored in that. In this, the centrality of the Indian Ocean region cannot be overemphasized in the emerging world order. As there is a need for strategic rebalance while carrying out the ongoing reform of the Indian armed forces in the Indian context. India essentially is a maritime nation. Our peninsular tip juts almost a thousand miles into the Indian Ocean. And this dictates that India play a pivotal growth strategic role in ensuring peace and in the peace in the most critical sea lanes of the world. At any one time, there are nearly 120 warships and extra regional powers deployed in the Indian Ocean region. There is also a race for strategic locations and bases of trade. China's aggressiveness, arrogance, and expansion, expansionism have major security challenges, not only along, along the line of active control, but more importantly in the Indian Ocean region, which has long, long term geopolitical, geostrategic, and geoeconomic implications. India will need to bind to balance not only to counter China, but to protect and project our own interests and that of the region. The Quad and the recently concluded Malabar exercises are the indicators of the emerging multilateralism. There are other nations in the IOR region with convergence and congress of interests with mutual concerns 
and hence we need to maintain cooperative relations with like-minded nations and extra regional powers. The canvas on the changing dynamics of the IUR is very large, and we are some of the best strategic thought leaders and experts among our eminent speakers, and I will, hence I will not take any more time. A couple of housekeeping rules uh, for the webinar, please. Uh, please write your comments, suggestions, and questions in the chat box. Uh, and uh, this also applies to uh, all our uh, uh, armed forces officers uh, and others who have joined us from the training establishments uh, uh, across the country. And there are very many of them. I, I can see them, the participants. Uh, you can also send your questions. We will try and answer and discuss these. However, in case we are out of time, and which is most likely, uh, these will be addressed by mail to the concerned participants. Uh, during the course of discussions, we will be enriched by divergent views and look forward to the discussion and remarks from our very eminent speakers. Uh, without much ado, uh, I will now request the Vice the Army Staff, uh, Lieutenant Sani, to deliver the address. Lieutenant Sani needs no introduction in this August gathering. Uh, he's a highly regarded inspector military leader. He has generated many of crucial appointments in the military operations directorate. Uh, he's commanded a, a CI force. Uh, he's commanded a core in the business sector. And he's commanded the Southern Army, uh, which of course looks after the peninsula. Uh, without much ado, over to Jen Sani. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, Director Senjos, Lieutenant General Manoj Pandey, Sinkan, Admiral Octavian, Director, Indonesia Defense University, distinguished panelists, including Admiral Arun Prakash, ladies, gentlemen. I am delighted to be part of the webinar Aero India 2021, organized by Center for Joint Warfare Studies in collaboration with the Army Design Bureau. The theme for the opening session of the webinar, Evolving Geopolitics of the Indian Ocean Region, is topical and of vital importance to us. The importance of the Indian Ocean Region is well known and documented. Its strategic location at the crossroads of global trade, vast drainage basin, home to almost 2 billion people, and its richness in natural resources all make it one of the most coveted and contested regions. But it is precisely due to these geographic factors, coupled with the slow but steady shift of power from the west to the east, which have resulted in the IOR becoming a hub of global geopolitical rivalry. The increasing interest of extra-regional forces and the existing challenges of piracy, human trafficking, illegal fishing, other non-traditional threats have all made the IOR volatile and a potential global battlefield. In fact, the governance and security of the IOR is already being undermined and challenged by non-state actors and nations with competing interests in the region. The countries of the IOR today face three common challenges of preserving the freedom of navigation in the region, inadequate arrangements for equitable and peaceful harnessing of natural resources, and the increasing incidents of piracy and natural disasters. These concerns have been further accentuated by unilateral actions by some nations, which have not only questioned the rights of the IOR nations to utilize their exclusive economic zones, but have also challenged their sovereignty over some of the strategically located islands itself. Such actions to change the well-established equilibrium have resulted in immense turbulence and an intense superpower rivalry in the IOR. In this backdrop, India's dominant position at the geographical center of the IOR, a robust economy, and a global standing as an upholder of law and democratic values, places it well to play a vital role in quest for peace and stability in the region. India has been increasingly engaging with all nations of the IOR and its outreach towards the East through the doctrine of Sagar or security and growth for all has been a cornerstone of its overarching foreign policy. In addition, the unfolding diplomacy, including military in the IUR, is clear indicator 
that the world powers want to forge partnerships with India to ensure peace and development in the region. Since 2008, the Indian Navy has continuously engaged multilaterally both with countries of and countries with interest in the Indian Ocean region under the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Our participation in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, naval exercises with stakeholders and HADR support in the Indian Ocean region reflect our belief that international engagements will lead the way towards security and growth for all. Therefore, our role as a net security provider in the region is now a strategic obligation and no longer a matter of choice. India, therefore, requires to formulate a well-defined IOR strategy and a follow-up and follow a robust capability development roadmap to live up to its potential in this region. Finally, my compliments to Senjos for providing an excellent platform to the distinguished speakers to share their thoughts on the contemporary topic. I'm sure the exchange of ideas and thoughts will enhance our understanding of the complexities of the region and assist us in formulating current policies to address the future challenges. Thank you, Jai. Uh, thank you very much to the Vice Army staff of Anami Jalasani uh, for the, laying down the foundation for the discussions uh, which are going to follow, uh, the three common challenges and related actions, uh, as also the convergence and complement plus. Uh, we'll be looking into it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I now call upon uh, the Director General Naval Operations, uh, Vice Admiral D.K. Tripathi, uh, to give his address, please. Thank you very much, sir. Admiral Arun Prakash, our former Chief of Naval Staff, Lieutenant General Saini, Vice Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Pandey, Commander in Chief, Andaman Nicobar Command. Flag and general officers, esteemed participants, distinguished personalities from the academia, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning, good afternoon to you all. Let me start by expressing my compliments to the Center for Joint Warfare Studies for organizing this webinar on a very topical topic. I'm also grateful to General Bhatia, Director St. Joe's, for inviting me to present my views on recent Indian military diplomacy initiatives in the Indian Ocean region. And here I will be talking largely about the Indian Navy. Dr. S. Jay Shankar, our Honorable Foreign Minister, while speaking a few days ago at the second Manohar Parikar Memorial Lecture, has very aptly highlighted, and I would quote him, we see diplomacy today much more than conducting diplomacy between trained diplomats. It is more about creating perceptions and shaping the discourse adequately. Securitizing foreign policy is an absolute imperative." Unquote. The Honorable Minister was spot on when he stated that the military can be an extremely effective platform to advance diplomatic goals even in situations that are not conflict-related. As is well known, most capable navies have four major roles, namely military, diplomatic, constabulary, and benign. Now, whilst our singular focus always remains on being combat-ready, our units are also in a position to carry out their diplomatic role in support of the nation's foreign policy, deftly, subtly, and yet most effectively. This audience is well aware of India's geography. General Wadia talked about the centrality of uh, oceans for India and India's security. Also, the importance of the seas for our economic development and well-being of our citizens. India being a maritime nation, also has a large stake in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. Since all oceans are interconnected, any nation 
with access to the seas becomes our de facto maritime neighbor. Now, India's outlook towards the Indian Ocean region is shaped by our civilizational ethos, which stresses upon the greater good of humanity at large. The ancient Indian concept of Vasudev Kutumbukam, meaning the entire world is a family, is well ingrained in our polity and people, and is also enshrined at the entrance of our parliament. This thought has seen a continuum over the millennia and was also articulated in 2015 by our Honorable Prime Minister as his vision of Saga, security and growth for all in the region. The Indian Navy has been highly active in military diplomacy in the IOR and beyond, and every naval officer or sailor is indeed a mobile ambassador of our country. This is a badge that we in the Navy we have with pride and a sense of responsibility. The Navy engages in military diplomacy through four pillars, namely capacity building, capability enhancement, cooperative engagements, and collaborative efforts. These foreign policy cooperation initiatives have demonstrated significant outcomes in shaping perceptions, as Admiral Dr. Jayashankar had initiated a few days ago, and bestowing upon us the moniker of the preferred security partner in IOR. The Indian Navy has been engaged in enhancing capabilities and facilitating self-reliance of IOR littorals and island nations through a multitude of measures including material and asset support. Now, whilst undertaking these activities, we have also gained by enhancing our maritime domain awareness through a combination of coastal surveillance radar systems, wide shipping and exchange agreements with a number of countries, and establishment of the International Fusion Center here at Gurugaon. Further, hydrographic co cooperation and provision of equipment and training has directly supported our nation's saga doctrine. We have also been conducting regular joint patrols in the exclusive economic zones of various friendly foreign countries based on their request and under mutually agreed protocols. Conducting training for personnel of friendly foreign countries, <clears throat> excuse me, together with our own personnel provides us an ideal platform for fostering mutual trust and interoperability. We have a robust training infrastructure comprising over 40 world-class training institutions in the Navy, which are capable of providing courses to suit varying requirements and capabilities of our partner nations. On an average, at any point of time, over 1,200 trainees from friendly foreign countries are trained at our facilities annually. Additionally, we have mobile training teams that are also being deputed regularly to provide customized on-site training to larger groups of personnel of host countries at their own facilities. During port calls of our ships, we routinely embark sea riders of host country maritime services for practical sea training. And our first training squadron ships, when they visit foreign ports, <coughs> embark under training officers of these countries during overseas deployments. In the field of constructive engagement, we have well established staff talks, bilateral and multilateral exercises, some of which were mentioned by the previous speakers, with different constructs and coordinated patrols with IOR liberals. These engagements have been beneficial towards addressing issues of piracy, armed robbery, drug tra trafficking, gun running, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which is a big nuisance. Other initiatives, such as the, the Goa Maritime Symposium and Goa Maritime Conclave at the level of uh, 
the service chiefs offer a unique platform for leaders from the region to share a platform for free and frank exchange of ideas. Our recent initiatives to engage with regional security constructs such as the Djibouti Code of Conduct and G7++ FOG, that is the Friends of Gulf of Guinea, are all steps in that direction. Our ships have also been deployed to support the World Food Pro 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 Program by escorting their vessels carrying food aid to needy countries. Therefore, it gave us immense satisfaction when the Nobel Peace Prize for 2020 was recently awarded to the World Food Program Organization. <clears throat> the Indian Navy has also been at the forefront of HADR operations in our maritime neighborhood. We have been the first responder on numerous occasions of unfortunate natural disasters and our expertise and capacities is leveraged by all our friends. Excuse me. <clears throat> Over the years, our warships have undertaken various HADR and SAR missions in the IOR. Some of some include post cyclone Bergita in Mauritius in January 2018, off Sahaita in October 18, post earthquake in Indonesia in March 2019 in Beira, Mozambique in aftermath of cyclone Idai, of Vanilla in January 2020 in Madagascar after the cyclone Dian. We launched Mission Sagar in May June 2020, provide COVID relief to Mauritius, Maldives, Madagascar, Seychelles, and Comoros. We also helped in salvage operations consequent to grounding of MV Wakashio of Mauritius in August 2020. Coordination of firefighting and salvage efforts of MT New Diamond of Sri Lanka in September of this year and Mission Saga 2 in October-November to provide relief to Eritrea, Djibouti, and North and South Sudan are some other examples. As we speak, Mission Saga 3 is underway to deliver humanitarian aid to our partners in Southeast Asia. Here, I must acknowledge that no military park planner can have all the resources that are needed in every given situation. And our Navy is no exception. But we are always ready and willing to share our, our resources for the benefit of our maritime neighborhood. This is in accordance with our vision for military diplomacy, facilitated by, by capable assets and a leadership with a clear appreciation of our importance of the maritime domain. In conclusion, I would state that there is a considerable churn in the geopolitical situation in the IOR and broader Indo-Pacific. As greater as great power rivalry intensifies in the Western Pacific, the IOR will feel its ripple effects, no doubt. This will be the true test of our military diplomatic outreach as we face the consequential opportunities and challenges. We therefore have to continue playing an increasingly important role, not only for security and prosperity of our nation, but also the larger Indian Ocean region. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have finished. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Coming from the Director General Naval Operations, uh, it means a lot. And uh, I, 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 uh, uh, honestly, I learned something new today that all sailors are mobile ambassadors. I knew that we are ambassadors, but mobile ambassadors, that's a, that's a very major responsibility uh, of the Indian Navy. You also led on the four pillars of military diplomacy. Uh, thank you very much indeed. It's been excellent just uh, listening to your initial remarks. I'm sure there will be many questions uh, which you need to answer thereafter. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Admiral Dr. Amarullah Octavia. Uh, he is the Commander Indonesian Naval and uh, Command Staff College. Uh, the admiral holds a bachelor's degree from Indonesia, 
a Naval Technical College, Master of Science degree from University of Paris, and is a doctorate degree in military sociology from Indonesian University. Uh, he has vast experience uh, in command and staff uh, in the Indonesian Navy, which I will not really uh, cover because it is, uh, uh, he, he has held all important and critical assignments, uh, both in command and staff. Uh, in the flag rank, he has been Commander Sea Battle Group, Western Fleet Command in 2013, uh, Chief of Staff, Western Fleet Command in 2014, Dean of Defense Management Faculty, Indonesia Defense University, 2016, and applied to his current position. He was appointed to represent, represent Indonesia as an expert and as part of the country's official delegations in several regional and international meetings. Uh, he has also given presentation speeches in a number of national and international symposiums, workshops, seminars, and working groups. These events include the ninth Global Maritime Domain Awareness, a Coastal Surveillance Symposium, a Session 5 uh, in Singapore, uh, Session 530 in Singapore, the 6th Asia Pacific Intelligence Chiefs Conference in Jakarta, and the Trilateral Dialogue of the Indian Ocean uh, in Canberra. Uh, there are a number of these, uh, and he's an uh, expert, and we really have to uh, listen to his uh, views. He's a professor in lecturer at Indonesia Defense University. He's also a lecturer at the Air Force Staff and Command College. Indonesian Joint Staff and Command College, University of Indonesia. He's a visiting professor at Naval Postgraduate School in 2016, uh, Japan National Defense Academy in 2017. So uh, the, the, uh, we have uh, one of the best speakers we have in the region. Uh, and without much ado, over to Admiral, uh, over to you, sir. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Major General Rafi Arora. Is it Clau uh, Lit and Cloud? How do you read me, uh, General? Absolutely yes, fine. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable uh, Lieutenant General uh, Pinot Batia, the Director of the Center for Joint uh, Warfare Studies. Uh, distinguished uh, Speaker, General, Admiral, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, slide one. First of all, I would like to thank the committee of Aero. Slide satu dulu. The committee of Aero India webinar for inviting me to share several academic perspectives in the in this reputable forum. I would also like to convey my deep appreciation and gratitude to the Center for Joint Warfare Studies. I hope this forum will open a window of opportunity to strengthen cooperation between India and Indonesia, as well as the military of both countries. This cooperation are essential to promote Indian Ocean Regional Architecture through Indian Ocean Region Association and Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Before starting my presentation, oh, so already uh, thank you very much for the introduce to, to uh, introduce me, uh, General Rafi. Next, these are the main references for my presentation. To open my presentation, please allow me to convey my appreciation to Indian military for successfully demonstrating its best capabilities on military operation order than war in the form of non-combatant evacuation and COVID-19 response in several neighboring countries during the past few months. In my view, Mission Saga 1 and 2 are very successful in improving the significant role and leadership of India in Indian Ocean region. Distinguished participants, in this webinar, I will share the Indonesian Navy experience in performing sea operation during the COVID-19 pandemic. Indonesian Navy also apply various lengthy health protocol to cope with the pandemic. Due to the concern of COVID-19 transmission, there is a tendency of cyclical inspection reluctance in warship. Shall the Navy inspect a suspected ship, the VBSS team 
must wear personal protective equipment. They are also unable to perform physical examination procedure, which increase the possibility of suspected ship crews hiding weapon under the clothes. The pandemic also lengthened the time required for inspecting suspected ship, as well as making the process making the process way more difficult and prone to be carried out in the evening. The law process in naval base is also hindered by the local people and law enforcers tend to refuse the arrival of detained ships at the coast. Standby medical team must be available at all time on the promise along with quarantine procedure for the suspected ships, crews, and all crime evidence. This procedure also requires additional costs and longer time, even content risk of infection. Ladies and gentlemen, in this slide, I would like to convey the importance of observing the development in naval technologies that have been deployed in the Indian Ocean. As we all know, several countries have deployed system in the ocean. Almost all warships are now competing to use UFE to its high effectiveness in carrying out various missions as an extended visual capability and as an extension of firepower. UFE are also a very important component in airspace and sea surface data collection. To hunt down China submarine, the United States Navy has, has even launched Sea Hunter, a special USB capable of operating independently for a very long period of time. China has also compensated this by launching a similar USB to hunt down the Sea Hunter and or U.S. warship. Unmanned systems are also deployed for undersea warfare. We also need to pay attention to various forms of unmanned subsurface vehicle that might be counterproductive against the interest of many states to maintain security stability in the Indian Ocean region. We can imagine the complexity of conventional ship sailing in the Indian Ocean should they have to deal with the unmanned system. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to the unmanned system, the current phase of military technology development has also opened the opportunity to harness big maritime data for optimizing the quality of decision-making process. In addition to collecting big maritime data from various sources for distribution to various stakeholders, the processing of such large volume of maritime data require artificial intelligence. As the backbone of control over the Indian Ocean, the Information Fusion Center in Gurugram can process big maritime data to support various Indian Navy operation with other navies in the Indian Ocean region. Ladies and gentlemen, to close my presentation, I would like to address several conclusions. First, new procedure and mechanism for VBISS team at sea has to be developed for carrying out law enforcement process in accordance with the COVID-19 protocol. Second, there is the need for an initiative to draw a new international law which is able to regulate the use of unmanned system at sea and ensure the safety of conventional ships and their crews. That is all the thought that I can convey in this uh, webinar. And I hope this webinar would be fruitful for all of us. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Thank you so very much uh, for our very
uh, for insight into your perspectives. Uh, we really value these uh, in India and abroad uh, with the experience, especially. Uh, well, uh, I think that's an excellent uh, uh, take on a need for new international laws for unmanned uh, systems. I think this is something which uh, the world would be much safer with the new laws and we write by them. Uh, and uh, we we need to send them cooperation. I fully agree between India and Indonesia. We have shared interests, we have mutual concerns, and we have old civilization links. Uh, thank you very much for spending your time. I'm really grateful to you uh, for being here. Thank you very much for your uh, initial comments also. And uh, we'll take it forward in the question answer session. Uh, next, I request uh, Admiral uh, Shri Khande uh, to give his comments uh, on uh, his initial comments. Uh, Admiral Shri Khande also doesn't need an introduction to this. Uh, he is a strategic thought leader. Uh, we find uh, we read a lot of what he writes. We listen to him in many forums. Uh, and he always comes out uh, with something uh, which is uh, uh, really incisive and insightful and uh, and contributes to our policy papers. Uh, over to Admiral Shri Khande, please. Edward uh, Shirikandes. Uh, request to unmute yourself, please. Maybe the volume is down. Maybe the volume is down. So just check your volume button also. Dispense with the earphones. Yes, you were getting you were getting you. So we heard you we heard you a little in between. Without earphones. Okay, um, um, morning, morning was clear. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, what we can do is by the time we resolve the technical uh, issues with Admiral Shri Khande, uh, may I request the uh, Commander in Chief of uh, Underman Nekaba Command, uh, General Pandey, uh, to de deliver his address. Uh, General Pandey, again, uh, uh, to this office gathering notes, needs no introduction, a very uh, renowned uh, military leader. Uh, we have uh, heard and seen him and served with him uh, all along. Uh, over to General Pandey. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely happy to be participating in the webinar this morning and talking on a subject with which uh, we at the Andaman and Nicobar Command are closely associated. And the subject is of joint exercises with the foreign navies and their relevance in the Iowa. Now, India's vision from the Indian Ocean region, as outlined by our Prime Minister in 2015, Envi Sajay Sagar, of which a couple of previous speakers have mentioned, uh, Sagar seeks to build, amongst others, a climate of trust and transparency respect for international maritime rules based order and uh, finding methods of enhancing maritime cooperation in keeping with this vision you are aware the indian navy has been proactively engaging with our maritime neighbors 
with an aim to shape a positive maritime environment and develop collective maritime military competence towards ensuring secure seas and becoming a preferred security partner for the littorals of the Iowa. Now, joint exercises and coordinated operations with foreign navies are a key element of this endeavor as they represent the highest level of trust and confidence between the member nations and are a key confidence building measure. Apart from forging interoperability through common SOPs, joint exercise also enables sharing of our best practices and technologies. Interoperability so achieved facilitates coordinated and joint conduct of operations when nations would come together for a common cause, be it in the realm of EZ patrols, anti-piracy, HADR, search and rescue, or even maritime interdiction operations. Over time, in the Indian Navy, exercises with foreign navies have grown from simple passage exercises to the complex multilateral exercises in our areas of maritime interest. These are conducted not only in the Indian Ocean region, but also with other like-minded maritime nations who have legitimate interest in the Iowa. The passage exercises are conducted regularly by Indian naval units with friendly foreign navies whenever opportunity arises in contrast to other planned exercises. This year alone, we have exercised with the navies of Japan, Australia, Russia, and the US. Increasing frequency of these exercises only signifies the growing acceptance and comfort levels amongst the participating navies. The Navy has now institutionalized bilateral exercises and coordinated patrols with various navies of the IOR littorals as well as extra regional navies. And the DGNO uh, alluded to this also. Today, the bilateral exercises and the passage exercises have become the mainstay of the joint naval exercises, with many such exercises conducted every year. Commensurate with the nature and strength of overall relationship with the participating countries, the level of participation and complexity of such exercises has also grown steadily from being basic exercises to weapon firing and participation of air and subsurface elements, including maritime patrol aircraft, fighter aircraft, and submarines. Coordinated patrols or corpacts along the International Maritime Boundary Line or the IMBL are being conducted with Bangladesh, Thailand, Myanmar and Indonesia every year and are aimed at forging interoperability and enhancing information sharing, primary dealing with challenges in the realms of subconventional operations. Now, these include poaching and drug trafficking. Conduct of these exercises on a scenario-based format recently has only helped in bringing more realism uh, in these exercises. Multilateral exercises are being conducted by the Navy since 2015. The Malabar series of exercises, which began as an annual bilateral exercise with the US Navy in 1992, was upgraded to a trilateral status in 2015 with the inclusion of Japan. The 24th and the latest edition of Malabar exercise in November this year, conducted in a non-contact at sea only format in the backdrop of COVID pandemic or the inclusion of Australia. Uh, you would be aware that the exercise was centered on Vikramaditya and the Nimitz carrier battle groups. In addition to dual carrier operations, advanced surface and anti-submarine warfare exercises and weapon firings were also undertaken, demonstrating the synergy, coordination, and interoperability 
between the four navies. The trilateral exercise settlements between Singapore, India, and Thailand navies was successfully conducted only last month in the Andaman Sea. All these actions are clearly reflective of the commitment of the participating countries to support a free, open, inclusive, as well as a rule-based international order in the maritime domain. The DGNO also mentioned of the fact that the Indian Ocean region is prone to natural calamities and man-made disasters. Disaster management should therefore be a vital area of cooperation in the region. Consequently, joint HADR operations assume significance towards formulation and implementation of an effective and coordinated response mechanism. The Indian Navy has been at the forefront of joint of HADR operations in the IOR. In this regard, the recent efforts and assistance in the aftermath of cyclone in Madagascar and Mozambique in the form of medicines, medical assistance and provision of other stores is noteworthy. The Indian Navy's experience and capacity in the field of HADR operations can be leveraged by all countries in the IOR for planning an effective response. Apart from this, exercises at sea are also being conducted on the sidelines of other multilateral engagements such as Milan and the International Fleet Review. The Navy also participates in exercises like the RIMPAC or the RIM of Pacific exercises. Besides enhancing interoperability, building trust and exchange of best practices, as highlighted earlier, the joint naval exercises also demonstrate a resolve and belief in the use of seas as global commons with a rule-based order rather than contested seas which threaten free flow of commerce and trade. Such exercises also serve to reassure our friends whilst signaling our resolve to potential adversaries. On the intangible side, joint exercises promote mutual respect and understanding amongst personnel of participating navies, both at the professional as well as at personal levels. Besides generating goodwill, joint exercises are also a tool for projection of a nation's soft power, that is culture, language, customs and beliefs, and help establish a unique spirit of bonding and friendship between communities. The fact that even during the peak of COVID pandemic, the coordinated patrols and passage exercises were conducted by us, albeit restricted to the non-contact sea phase only, amply highlights our resolve and commitment towards these initiatives. The relevance of joint exercises with foreign navies will only increase in the future in the emerging security dynamics in the IOR. The scope, content and participation in these exercises needs to be progressively enhanced to meet traditional and non-traditional security challenges thus allowing us to develop a shared understanding and formulate a common set of strategies to deal with such issues. Looking ahead, we need to consolidate our gains and explore new areas and dimensions of cooperation. These exercises can also validate and further improve existing information sharing arrangements to build better maritime as well as underwater domain awareness. In conclusion, I wish to reiterate that the new maritime security paradigm will continue to challenge the freedom and safety of global columns. Our maritime strategy should therefore continue to evolve and adopt a multi-pronged approach of which cooperative engagement and joint training with navies will form a key element. I will finish here. Uh, thank you for your attention and Jahin.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, General Pade, to the Commander Chief. Uh, you have really uh, brought out some excellent uh, points to take home. Uh, joint access confirm our resolve and belief in the seas of global common in a rule based world order. It, uh, it uh, fosters mutual strength and understanding. It generates goodwill and soft power. And we have to look at the new sphere of the paradigm. Uh, thank you very much indeed for spending your time. I know how busy you all are. Uh, thank you indeed. Um, uh, now I hand over to uh, General Shiri Khande. Uh, I'm sure the technical issues have been resolved. Uh, or to uh, Admiral Shiri Khande. My fault for the general. Uh, well, uh, Admiral and General is the same thing in the joint, uh, in, <laughs> in joint warfare center of joint warfare studies. Or to Admiral Shiri Khande. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, I, I want to thank St. George and the IMR for the opportunity to participate in this important discussion. Uh, India is really quite lucky to have had sovereign ter island territories in the Andaman and Nicobar group, stretching from the Preparish Channel in the north near Myanmar to the Great Channel in the south, beyond which our good neighbor and friend Indonesia itself lies stretching across the Indian Ocean into the Pacific. Off our western Malabar coast lie the Lakshadweep and Minikoi Islands, again extending from the Chetlet Island, which is seaward of Mangalore on the mainland, to Minikoi Island to the south, of which is the 8 degree channel uh, 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 is, is at, at, at the southernmost end. To south of this channel lies another friend, the Maldives. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a brief layout of the mental maps that you all already carry within yourselves. I will return to some aspects of the geostrategic angles to these island groups. But before that, and straight off the bat, let's talk about China and its island issues because they serve to contrast with several matters of our own islands and of Indian statecraft. As has been said, China's strategic outlook is one with belligerent underlays. Its statecraft is geared towards expansionism that has been well understood for nearly a decade now but never more clearly regionally and globally as during and due to the current pandemic. When we specifically look at the importance of islands, we must note China's reiteration of some core interests in what it calls the first island chain that, among others, create direct, clear and ever-present concerns for Taiwan and Japan. Within the same sea areas, but a little to the south, are the increasing concerns, notably from ASEAN littoral nations in the South China Seas. China's inflating its historical claims, the creation of artificial islands as territory with unique misinterpretation of international laws are creating serious tensions well beyond ASEAN and East Asia. China may make much of the US government not having or being unable to ratify UNCLOS in the Senate. However, China, which is a signatory itself, either throws UNCLOS to the winds at sea or ignores rulings like the one on Philippines by the ICT in 2016. The US may not have gone through the entire internal ratification process for whatever reasons, but it does support and uphold UNCLOS. In fact, what China is doing along the first island chain and in its quote unquote close seas, the old adage, he who rules the waves can wave the rules, comes to mind. Its geostrategic assessments in the second island chain are as, much of a it's, uh, are, are as much of a concern that draws in a great power like the US with its system of alliances and commitments of support via treaties and acts, or further away for an island continent like Australia and even political groups in Papua New Guinea who are concerned about Chinese fisheries and harbor development enterprises. Then, as if the two island chains were not enough, the third chain spreading further into the Pacific has come into common parlance. Does this con concern sound a bit overstated? Perhaps not. What, you, what would you be thinking today if you were a citizen of Ecuador uh, and thinking about what is happening to the fish around Galapagos Islands? To Chinese fishing fleets in the hundreds. On the other hand, India provides a contrast. The contrast is not one in which India does not see any geostrategic advantages of our own island territories, 
for the protection of Indian interests. First and foremost, securing one's own interest is necessary. Rather, I would say the contrasts are elsewhere. First, rarely does one hear the suffix chet applied for the Andaman and Nicobar group or the Lakshadweep group. And for that matter, we all have grown up as mariners referring to the Indian archipelago and its hundreds of islands uh, just as that. I don't really recall thinking of them as the Indonesian island chain and I don't think uh, uh, Indonesian citizens also think of their uh, you know, great uh, extended uh, uh, archipelago as a, as a chain. Second, unlike in China's case, India does not have disputes with its neighbors on issues of sovereignty, consequent exclusive economic zone and resource quarrels, and no one side has really needed to be muscular with the other. It also needs to be acknowledged that this was not automatically so, but it, it, that it was to the credit of mature statecraft on, on, on everybody's part that maritime boundary and jurisdiction issues were resolved slowly but steadily with all but one of our many neighbors. This is not a lightly made observation. It is a reiteration of preference for a rules-based order which uh, Admiral Octavian said, and not out of weaknesses of the parties, but rather towards a cooperative approach to mutual security. This contrasts with China, which, while creating a facade of cooperation, is actually bulldozing and creating new problems. And quite literally, I may add, as far as bulldozing and dredging is concerned in the reefs and man-made islands and expansion of smaller outcrops in the South China Sea. Third, the militarization of places where sovereignty itself is most questionable is certainly a worry, well beyond those in the littoral. This contrasts with India's cooperative approaches with its neighbors and the years, if not multiple decades of maritime and other security cooperation with most of them. In fact, on the matter of islands, there are several examples of deep security cooperation, prevention of coups and stabilization that India has undertaken with Indian Ocean region island nations and yet not got involved any deeper than in helping with the immediate problem it was asked to help with. China simply does not create that assurance, even when its involvement as a quick loan provider, a pushy investor, even insistent military hardware supplier to those nations in, which are themselves now increasingly concerned by its action and rhetoric. On its part, India is bolstering the economic development and security architecture of its islands. We need not feel shy of saying that our island territories are not chains that will bind everyone who means well. But for those behaving adversarially or during conflict, both island chains will become increasingly important. They form the bulwark for defense and if required in conflict. A forward stance for sea control and power projection. Nonetheless, it is our friendly relationship with ASEAN members that gives them confidence in our intentions not being inimical to them. True, there have been occasionally diplomatic, economic, and even some socio-diplomatic concern now and then. But the contrast with China is quite self-evident even for spec skeptics. Fourth, strategically, our islands in the West and East are well placed to assist in the freedom of the seas for global trade. Yet, they are equally well placed in terms of maritime geography to selectively disrupt trade should India's security concerns and possibly possible conflict requirements um, demand so. To that end, the emphasis on integration and jointness being placed in India at the highest political level is really important. The consequent defense reorganization will help India's own security interests in the first place and further our friendly relations and mutual security frameworks via military diplomacy, coordinated and joint patrolling, as well as through exercises, as has been covered by previous speakers. To say that no nation is an island may, of course, be an adapted cliche. But nations that have islands, as several, of course, do, can leverage them for the greater good and not for greater angst or concerns. Islands can provide increased legitimate security for the sovereign nation 
but also be part of cooperative security efforts for other neighbors. That is why the Andaman and Nicobar and Lakshadweep Islands matter for India and for the Indian Ocean region and indeed the Indo-Pacific as well. Uh, thank you for your time. I have finished. Uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Kande. It's been a pleasure listening to you. As always, educated. Uh, he who rules the world gave the rules, uh, which is uh, well known to us. So we need uh, we need to create the capabilities and NASA capacities uh, to ensure uh, a secure, a rule-based world order in the Indian Ocean region. There, there can be no doubts about it. And uh, the, the emphasis you lay on integration jointness, I think uh, we are moving towards it a little late though, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, come to the end of the first sessions from the speakers. Uh, we only have one question uh, for this, and that question comes from uh, Abhijit Pandey. He says, my question is, what will be the role of artificial intelligence and related technologies in the Navy's in the navies by 2030. I think it's a very interesting question. Well, uh, well, we uh, you know battled the pandemic in the 2020. We do not even know what the 2020 what 2021 looked like. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't have to look ahead. And artificial intelligence, I think, will have to will be uh, uh, a technology which needs to be absorbed, which needs to be inducted first, absorbed, and then exploited. Uh, would you like to take it on, uh, Mr. Uh Yes, thank you. Uh, it, it's always a very interesting uh, matter to you know think about artificial intelligence and and to to reassure yourself that all the work in artificial intelligence has really been done by human intelligence um, and 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 that is the way it will it will be so. Artificial in, in intelligence, in a sense, might form some kind of a spine uh, for a technical spine, a data spine, everything together for a lot. That, that will happen in terms of uh, 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 intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, ISR, what will, what will go into the way uh, uh, unmanned uh, vessels will operate. And uh, like the Indonesian uh, 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 Defense University rector mentioned, um, we have to think about, uh, about rules and regulations that govern how artificial intelligence will, will function safely and cooperatively while uh, lo looking at looking at the interests of that nation which owns these platforms, unmanned platforms, uh, unmanned uh, sensors, which are all fused together. There are certainly going to be challenges. We cannot go back to a world uh, where artificial intelligence is still into the future. It is very much part of our present and it will be increasingly part of our future. And therefore, uh, it is not only navies, but armed forces as a whole. Uh, that will have to integrate uh, even artificial intelligence and uh, look at look at leveraging it uh, in a way that uh, that that comes to assistance uh, is a force multiplier and at the same time uh, it adheres to aspects of a rules based order and many aspects of the laws of armed conflict uh, as uh, you know most nations observe that so uh, uh, we will we'll, we'll, we'll have to work hard towards it and I'm sure every every country uh, represented in this webinar uh, is looking at that very, very carefully. Now, thank you, Admiral Shrikhande. Uh, would the uh, DG and Admiral Tripathi like to add something to this? Uh, sir, uh, first of all, uh, I'm not a technocrat, uh, but uh, I will make an attempt. Uh, the short answer to the question is absolutely. And as Admiral Shrikhande brought out, it is not future. We're not looking at 2030. It is here and now. Uh, you would know, sir, that uh, Indian Navy, all of you would know that Indian Navy is a highly technologically intensive service. It has been in the past, it is today, and it will remain so. Because of the issues of space, etc., we always want to uh, militarize our equipment and we want to induct force multipliers. Uh, we, uh, there, there, is a, there is a price to be paid on space, on board our platforms. And therefore, uh, we are alive to this uh, development of new technology, so-called artificial intelligence, uh, and also applied machine learning. Uh, we want to, in fact, we have created a center of excellence uh, last year in 2019, which is looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, and 5G technologies. Uh, some, of the, some of the fields in which we want to use uh, the artificial intelligence, and we have made started making progress, uh, includes, of course, the uh, autonomous vessels, as Admiral Shikhande brought out, drones, SOMs, uh, 
predictive maintenance of our uh, platforms. Uh, instead of making a manual note or somebody reminding that uh, you know a particular equipment is due for so and so early inspection, the AI and ML tools will automatically tell the operator that uh, you better get going on this uh, equipment. Uh, prescriptive analysis, uh, analytics, another area, cyber security, it's a big threat and it is evolving field. Uh, or if you know more than me, uh, that is one area where we want to get into this AI ML. Uh, and of, of course, the, the data management, all kinds of data, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, photographic, IR, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that is where we are looking at, sir. Uh, as I said, uh, Navy has already made a, a start that by commissioning a center of excellence. And uh, increasingly, as we go ahead, we need to uh, remain aware that uh, all other navies, whether it is friendly navies or uh, our peers and uh, competitors, are also doing the same thing. So uh, we are on board, sir, and uh, uh, 2030 is too far away. We have to get uh, this technology uh, on today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. That's absolutely right. Uh, I think UA technology has to be uh, definitely absorbed as of today and not uh, 2030. Uh, one who controls the uh, absorbs the UA technologies, uh, geo technology is very important. Uh, the geo strategy, the geopolitics, and geoeconomics uh, will be dictated by the uh, nations and the militaries who control uh, geo technologies. Thank you very much. We, we have another question, and it's a very interesting one. Uh, what will be the effect of formation of Canada commands in achieving the goals we have for a stronghold over the Indian Ocean region? Uh, uh, may, may, may I request uh, General Pandey to take this on, please, initially? The table is the formation of the Yes, um, of the integrated maritime command. I think towards optimizing our resources, uh, you know, improving jointness, improving synergy, improving interoperability. A lot of it, what we discussed during the first half. I think uh, the formation of the theater commands, the institution of theater commands, uh, would be a step in the right direction. Especially uh, in the maritime domain, I think it has a lot of relevance and a lot of merits. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. I think there's going to be no doubt about it that uh, joint integration, as was brought out by Shri Kandev also by all the speakers, uh, is the way forward. And uh, we, we are looking at it. The shape and contours would, uh, I think, uh, be very clear in a uh, a months, a few months time, uh, but uh, there's no doubt about it that this is, is the way forward. Uh, integration and jointness is dictated to us uh, by uh, nothing else but the uh, challenges I said, uh, but that are challenges posed by China, challenges posed by COVID-19, uh, the many challenges we face, because I think the armed forces, as I see it, uh, because of our challenges and our resources will be asked to do uh, more and more in less and less. And how do we integrate everything, synergize everything, optimize everything uh, is the challenge. And that is where we are uh, moving forward to it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's, there are another two questions, and this is uh, related to basically the exercises. Uh... Uh, just seven, I'll just take them on. There are plenty of questions to be answered. Yeah, two points in the formation of exercises. It says, uh, the question is from uh, Rakesh Sharma. It says, uh, Malabar, which has been for some time, are the only basic and corrector. Unlike the two-sided exercises, I, I, my, I'm, I'm a technologically good, but technically in, inept. It moves. Uh, where is that gone? I'll combine two questions which are there. Yeah, it's a, unlike the two side exercise with the US and Texas, other navies, uh, second destruction of maritime trade is actually a declaration of war. And it is very difficult as these ships, but confusing national flags uh, like of Bahamas. 
is it, so the, and the second question is, is Indian Navy opting for some more submarines instead of a third aircraft carrier? I think that this question would be best left unanswered this is in the capital development field and uh, we'll take it on uh, later on. Uh, the next question, are the correct, are the chances to solve the, no, I, I think we'll leave the Eastern Ladakh a bit out of this, otherwise there will never be any, uh, you know, we'll run out of time. Uh, so that is uh, the question which we need to answer uh, on the basic, uh, uh, this thing of uh, our exercises. Uh, General Pandey, would you like to take this on please? So can I have the question once again, please? Yeah, specific I, I, I part. Ask the question again. Uh, it says uh, the question is uh, like what he's actually implying is that the exercise we do are very basic. Even Malabar, which has been on for some time, is only basic in character. Unlike the two side exercise the US undertakes for the navies. And second, the disruption of maritime trade is actually a declaration of war and is very difficult as these ships fly confusing national flags like that of Bahamas and Bahamas and others. I request you to take on the first question. I request Edwin Shrekhan to take on the next question. And of course, uh, the DG and Uru Chetan. Uh, as far as uh, these exercises are concerned, I think, and I mentioned this in my talk, that uh, now that these have stabilized over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we need to look at uh, how do you expand the scope uh, and the participation and the content further and maybe you can look at certain other areas in which uh, you know to derive maximum benefit so that is something which uh, the naval headquarters and uh, planners will have to sit down and see as to how do you extract maximum value out of what we are currently doing uh, and uh, I mean, while we may not be able to discuss here, but uh, I also mentioned that uh, over a period of time, the scope and the areas of cooperation, etc., have actually expanded from what they were initially. So I think we are moving in the right direction and uh, perhaps need to further expand the scope as we go forward. Uh, thank you. I think that's the way forward. Uh, we can't, uh, you know, uh... Uh, we will have to take it as it comes, uh, slow and steady. We can't be jumping absolutely to two side exercises. I think this Malabar exercise, which we're getting in November, uh, is a landmark exercise. It's a, it's a great indicator at the strategic level or geopolitical level. Thank you very much. Administrator, would you like to ask the next question, please? Yes, I, I'll, I'll also add, a, add a, you know, a couple of yeah, sentences please. about the Malabar <laughs> exercise itself. Because from 1992, actually, the Malabar exercises have been going on. And several editions of those have been actually very complex exercises. Uh, so they are, they are not basic exercises. It is also uh, the, the nature of exercises that in terms of logistics, in terms of uh, 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 units that can be you know, designated for exercises, it is, it is by no means necessary or laid down that the next exercise has to be more complex than the, than, than the current one and that it is always a rising, uh, rising line of complexity. It goes up and down in terms of uh, the, the, the terms of reference of each exercise, the types of units participating. But I can say that in the Malabar exercises, whether it was bilateral, trilateral, or in some cases with four and even five partners, as it happened in 2007, the exercises are, uh, you know, have been of, in fact, uh, great complexity. So uh, they, 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 they have used the big, you know, big, uh, uh, deepest technologies that, that can be uh, available and shared with each other. So uh, Malabar exercises, I think, are going uh, going on well. The second question about uh, trade. Yes, it is true that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, commandeering of ships, uh, boarding ships, inspecting papers uh, with, with intent for contraband, etc., are actually strong actions and that they are uh, actions in times of great tension or conflict itself. So, but what what happens is is that even during peacetime, the monitoring of traffic, the ability to uh, sh shepherd traffic, uh, the ability to convoy our own traffic, and the ability to interdict an adversary's uh, traffic in a selected manner, continue to be important tasks uh, for uh, for a navy, uh, which can be then uh, you know translated into into uh, uh, into more actions uh, should the should the political need and the military need for that develop. So uh, that is the way I would look at maritime trade warfare. 
Admiral Tripathi, do you would like to add anything, please? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I think I agree with uh, both Jatul Pandey and uh, Mr. Khande. As far as uh, Malabar is concerned, uh, we have come a long way from 1992. Uh, I remember I used to be a young lieutenant. Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, as Eastern Fleet Commander, I took the ships to, uh, to off Guam and uh, to Western Pacific and conducted the Malabar 2018 there. Uh, with the, of course, uh, the multitude of uh, U.S. forces, Japanese forces, and uh, and my own uh, Indian naval ships and units. And this year's exercise, sir, uh, you would appreciate were conducted on both coasts, and they were non-contact exercises. So non-contact has two elements. One is normally when we carry out uh, such complex exercises, there are various in-person meetings between planning teams. And uh, that luxury we did not have this year. Therefore, one must appreciate that uh, two carrier battle groups with four countries participating. And uh, of course, the, uh, uh, we have come a long way in interoperability, etc. But still, we require the planners need to sit together and work out what needs to be done in which manner and what kind of orders are to be issued, etc. Et like I said, we didn't have the luxury. And still, we managed to do this exercise as a relatively short notice. I know because I'm here, I was here. And that is a big credit to the all of our countries that despite the luxury of not having in-person meeting, it was all virtual. When we came to a, a common platform that these are the exercises which will be carried out, these are the kind of units which will take part, these are the timelines of exercises. So that was a big gain because of uh, the COVID situation. As I think Shikhande brought out, sir, uh, it is not a, there is no fixed uh, template that this is the way it has happened this year and uh, for next year this is going to happen this way. It all depends on kind of units, area, uh, time of the year, etc., etc., and the uh, suitability of each participant to uh, do what is the uh, what is decided by everybody else. I just give an example that we carried out uh, some very very advanced. Uh, I would say uh, level of exercise with Singapore again in uh, 2018, uh, where which included firing of weapons, uh, firing of missiles going around. So that doesn't happen uh, every day. That happens only when you've got that uh, understanding uh, of each other's practices. And uh, when I say yes, it means yes and not no. Uh, so therefore, with uh, with uh, Malabar construct. Uh, there is always a scope for improvement. I would not say that uh, we have reached, we have plateaued. But I think we have come a long way and therefore we cannot call it uh, basic. It is no more basic exercise. There are huge, uh, huge, uh, uh, you know, advances in the level what we did in the 90s and uh, where you've reached now, sir. Uh, we, we have uh, many questions to be answered. Uh, but I think I'll take on the more important ones first. Uh, there was a question again, uh, we talked of uh, a partner can not take on all the questions, but we'll definitely get back to you uh, on the questions. This is about... Yeah, in the part exercises, there, no, this is again a question. Uh, in the part exercises, are there issues of interpreters since we use Russian equipment uh, while the other three navies have uh, Western uh, equipment? Uh, uh, I, I might take it very simple in that. I think uh, our hats off to our sailors, uh, soldier and warriors. We have equipment from Russia, we have equipment from the US, from, the, from Israel, from France, uh, from other nations, uh, and we exploit them to the best of abilities. Uh, would you like to answer this question, uh, the DJN of peace? Sir, uh, you, have, you have hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, you have to manage with what you have. Certainly, uh, we have, and it is not only Russian equipment you have got. Uh, just for the uh, and, uh, knowledge of the uh, gentleman or lady who asked this question, uh, we have a mix of uh, technologies, indigenous, and also something which we, we don't we didn't have at that point of time. We have imported, and therefore, uh, a platform like ship has got all kinds of weapons and sensors. Uh, so radars, sonars, uh, the EW systems are all indigenous. Most of them are indigenous. Uh, the fire control radars, some of them are indigenous. Some are, some are, some we had to get it from outside. Missiles, etc. We, we we know all that. But to, we have integrated all that, 
and uh, we have mastered the art of uh, exporting them. And therefore, when you uh, when you operate with a foreign navy, it doesn't matter uh, to him or to me uh, what kind of equipment you have got. And therefore, uh, we have faced uh, no, no problems at all uh, in uh, operating with any of the navies, including the Western ones. Uh, we have a question from uh, Harika Mishra. Uh, he asked, how do provisions of the UNCLOS deal with the role of defense force in disputes uh, which are primarily legal and diplomatic uh, uh, in nature? Uh, uh, Admiral Shri Khande, it's uh, uh, open to all the panelists in any case. Uh, uh, Jan Pandey, uh, Admiral Tripathi, please. Admiral Shri Khande. Okay. Uh, I, um, that's that's uh, an interesting question, but you know, one way of looking at UNCLOS, the United Naval Nations Convention for Laws of the Sea, is that it is a legal document. It is very much part of the legality and very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, the mainframe on which uh, the, the rules based order at sea uh, is, is staked. So, uh, uh, the, the UNCLOS, if, if you respect the UNCLOS, if you go by the rulings, then you are doing much uh, to ensure that there is a rules-based order, especially at sea, and which is why uh, it is very important as as why that you know the seas are called the global commons because they are really common to all mankind, uh, and and keeping them open, free, and secure uh, without creating uh, issues that China is creating right now in the South and East China seas is very very important. So therefore. UNCLOS remains the backbone on which uh, uh, nations need to look at, work out, and align align their national laws and actions uh, to the stipulations in UNCLOS. Minor variations are done; uh, they are they are they are possible under UNCLOS, but nothing like what China is doing. So it is very much part of the legality of what we do at sea and what we do with the sea. Uh, thank you very much. I think we'll be uh, running out of time in case we take all the questions. Uh, but to all those participants who have uh, been asking questions, and there are some very interesting questions. This, this of course, calls for a separate webinar altogether, uh, some of them. Uh, but we will try best to uh, mail the answers to you, uh, taking inputs from our uh, uh, very eminent panelists. Uh, I, I, have, I have one last question before we have a couple of minutes more. Uh, I can't be late. Uh, the former CNS is chairing uh, the next session. Uh, if we were to just uh, give one, uh, uh, just one challenge and one opportunity uh, in the changing dynamics uh, in the Indian, Indian Ocean region, uh, what would that be? And that goes out to all the panelists. And if we, we, we start with uh, uh, Admiral Shri Kande, you are online. Uh, yes, sir. I think I think the one the one opportunity and as you mentioned, the challenge with it is greater consonance between all participants. I think China needs to be counterbalanced. Uh, it, it is it has been at least I feel this way that when people have been talking about, you know, changing China's behavior, what has actually happened is China has been extremely successful in using every pressure from the dime diplomatic, informational, military and economic to actually make the world behave very differently towards it rather than the other way around. And uh, uh, of, of most nations today uh, have have problems, which one one of one of the you know consequential effects of the COVID virus is that problems that existed even before COVID in 2019 and perhaps for as I mentioned a decade before that suddenly seem to be far clearer, uh, and perhaps that is one of the side effects of the virus itself uh, that we see the China threat uh, for what it really is. And I think that is the opportunity we have to come together to get China to be a better member of the world's, you know, community of nations, uh, so that we can actually uh, look at look at peace uh, with greater confidence, in which China also plays a role. Uh, thank you, Admiral Shekhande. Uh, Jal Pandey, please. Uh, I said from my perspective, I think the opportunity is to better leverage the geostrategic location of the Andaman group of islands, Andaman and Nikoroba group of islands. And to that extent, I think we have made a beginning. We are no longer looking at the Andaman Nicobar group only sort of to defend or safeguard, but to look at it in a more proactive manner. How can we leverage the location? 
And the challenge is related to this. Having said this, how do you make it happen on ground uh, in terms of, you know, shall we say the budgetary support, the resources available, the infrastructure development issue. So these are the two things which I feel are critical if we have to sort of look at IOR as uh, something which is uh, absolutely important to us. Yes. I think that you're absolutely right. This, this, this is quite as of not today as of yesterday. Uh, the strategic location, geostrategic location of is exceedingly important. Thank you very much. Uh, Admiral uh, Tripathi, please. Very cryptic, sir. Cryptic, uh, I know you're running out of time. I think more of synergy and collaboration in the IOR, more of it than competition. And that is the challenge which is there today. It is going to, do, we, are, we feel that it is going to remain tomorrow. And as you are aware, the, uh, our country, and especially I can talk of Indian Navy, is making uh, all out efforts to ensure uh, the facilitation of this synergy between countries, between maritime services, uh, and more uh, collaboration than competitions. Uh, thank you very much. I think with this, we come to the end of the session. Uh, I will not even try to conclude. There are so many interesting points that have come up. The only thing I would like to say is, uh, when we look at, you know, uh, undoubtedly we need, we need a, a, a review and a reset and refresh of our uh, policies. There's no doubt about it, especially in view of the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 in China. Uh, the only thing I would like to say is that, you know, whatever we do, our India policy uh, should be pro-India and not anti any adversary or any, any nation. It should be pro-India. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the eminent panelists. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, thank you to the Vice Shud Army staff. Uh, my uh, special thanks uh, to Admiral Amarullah from Indonesia, uh, the DGN uh, Admiral Tripathi, uh, to General uh, Mohan Pandey, the Commander in Chief of the Underman Command, and to Admiral uh, Shri Pandey. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all the participants uh, who are online and those uh, who are also attending in uh, various conference halls uh, in, in, in the institutions of. Uh, uh, our forces. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are at uh, the time. We still have a couple of minutes to go. I will, uh, 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 sir, if you uh, permit, I will start on the next session straight away. Uh, Admiral Anand Prakash, sir. With you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, I think uh, the next session starts now. Uh, I will not even try and introduce uh, Edward, Edward Prakash, the former chief of naval staff. Uh, he's too tall a figure to be introduced to this uh, gathering. Everyone knows him. Uh, he's widely acknowledged both in India and abroad. The world has been candid and sharpest strategic thought leaders. Uh, so we're extremely fortunate that you could spare your time and support us in this initiative. Uh, your words will mean a lot to us. Uh, you have been part of uh, all the major reform committees of the Indian Armed Forces, starting the Anunsan Committee, going right up to the National Task Force. Uh, we could not have asked anyone better than you, uh, whatsoever, anywhere. And I will not even you know, go and uh, try to uh, uh, list out any of your uh, achievements uh, in, the, uh, in the 40 years of service and beyond. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I now hand over to Admiral Anun Prakash uh, to conduct the next session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, General Bhatia, uh, for inviting me. and. Uh, I am greatly privileged to be here this morning with you. Uh, for an old timer like me, there can't be anything more heartening than to see an organization such as St. Jaws, headed by a senior Lieutenant General of the Indian Army, hosting an event like this. And um, to see um, senior Army officers dressed in combat fatigues, speaking with confidence, enthusiasm about maritime issues. I think it's a very good start. It speaks. It portends well for, for our future, where we see theatre command looming over the horizon. So thank you very much, uh, St. George, for having um, um, organized this event and for inviting me. The topic for this uh, latter half of this uh, webinar is Chinese challenges to India's interests. Uh, I thought that the first challenge would be time management to, to uh, <clears throat> confine four or five eminent speakers into the time available, from. but from whatever I've seen in the morning session, everybody's kept immaculately to time, and I don't see that as a problem. So um, without wasting much time, I'll jump straight into this topic and catch the bull by its horns. What are the interests that we are speaking about? What are 
impressed that China poses a challenge to them. And interest, national interests are, are a vague and ambiguous term, often misused for political ends, etc. But without entering into an arcane discussion on this subject, I can mention one or two which strike you as obvious. First of all is safeguarding our sovereignty and the integrity of our land, sea, and air boundaries. And secondly, it is uh, it is the freedom to pursue in peace our socio-economic and developmental activities for uplifting our people. And as as uh, as General Bhatia mentioned, to have a modern, prosperous, and secure nation. Those are the vital interests that one can name without fear of contradiction. And China seems to threaten all three of them by blatant territorial encroachment and by forcing us to divert our scarce resources and energies to national security rather than to development where they should be going. So in addition to this direct threat that we all know about, uh, there are many of our vulnerabilities, both domestic as well as in our neighborhood, where China poses a threat to us. Um, and since this is a maritime uh, sort of uh, topic, then on the high seas, there are many areas in which we see China as a looming threat, either immediate or, or in the future. <clears throat> Um, because it's because of its intrusive and aggressive conduct, um, China can clearly be pointed out as, as a future threat or or, or a non-cooperative entity uh, in, in our near vicinity. For example, the Indian Ocean bases uh, or, or places, whatever you choose to call them, they used to call them a string of pearls, but starting from Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and of course Djibouti. China has established a string of places where its navy naval ships can put into. Uh, then it's exploitative and ambitious a belt and road initiative in which India has very wisely abstained from the maritime um, silk route, which which will cut a huge swath right across the Indian Ocean, leading right up to Africa. So um, these are all pot potentially threatening to us, <clears throat> and the very fact that this seminar is being um, is being conducted on, on a maritime uh, uh, topic, I think is a is a clear um, indication of where we should be looking for challenges. Um, I didn't mention the fact that China is now amongst the top three suppliers of arms to arms worldwide. And amongst its top, top customers are uh, nations in our neighborhood, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. So these are all threatening developments. Now the world wonders about China's rational and motivations. It's an economically uh, prosperous nation. In fact, uh, once this COVID issue dies down a little bit, we will find that um, most nations are, uh, economies are on, on a down, uh, down slope, whether it's USA, Australia, Japan, etc. Uh, and uh, India, of course, people are talking about 10% um, decline in growth rate. But China will, will be having, am I still uh, audible and visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All well. All right. Okay. Um, so, um, and China will be one of the few nations, possibly the only only nation, which is still going to show 1.9% growth rate. So it is economically pro prosperous, militarily strong, getting stronger. The, the PLA Navy is going to be larger than the US Navy numerically soon. Uh, the army is huge. And um, technologically, China is now hoping, aspiring to be neck to neck with the USA. So given all these positive things that are going for China, why on earth is it uh, escalating tensions with the USA, with Australia, with Japan? Why is it creating crisis situations which are stretching from Eastern Ladakh and our northern borders to uh, Senkaku Island, the East China Sea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and, and so on? Uh, so these are questions that we need to ask ourselves and ask our friends and neighbors as to what is the motivation that is making China go. Unfortunately, we in India have lacked adequate insight into Chinese mindsets. Perhaps it is due to absence of adequate study, examination, uh, absence of adequate scholarship. And all this has combined to, combined to lead us to faulty analysis of China's motivations and perhaps a misreading of their intent. And therefore, our responses have also been not quite appropriate. And it's not that China has not given us enough warnings. Right from 1962, why I would say even 1950s, when they took over Tibet, China has been sending adequate warning signals. 
but unfortunately political and diplomatic complacency has led us to believe that an undemarcated 4000 long kilometer boundary uh, will will remain stable now when you have a line which is called line of actual control open to interpretation by either side i think that's an invitation to blackmail by the stronger party and every transgression of the lse has been attributed to misunderstanding and so on so i think we've been far too forgiving and um, allowed hope to prevail over common sense and security consciousness and i would just mention one more fact and that is after every war the warring nations the, the belligerents get together sit around the table and try to remove the casus belli the, the cause of that war we have unfortunately for 58 years after the 62 war we have ignored this casus belli and allow it to languish so all these have combined to um, to put us in this awkward situation that we are in uh, returning to china's motivations i mean if you try and guess make an educated guess what is what is driving china is it illusions of grandeur they want to be a superpower sure yes is it an internal power struggle where xi jinping is trying to make his mark and uh, re- hang on to his <clears throat> his position or is it just plain hegemonic intent tangxia or the, as, as the, as the chinese call it in mandarin where the middle kingdom rules over all under heaven uh, is it a manifestation of george modelsky's long cycle which says that the international order seeks a hegemon and every 80 to 100 years there's a change of hegemon so the, the usa has been a hegemon for for too long it's time for change and china is the logical successor um or is it or whatever the motivation one of the factors that is motivating china is to keep india from becoming a peer competitor and that's that's clear that india has to be kept down uh, whatever by whatever means so i think that is something that we need to take a uh, note of time for the government of india to consider issuing a white paper in which a white paper on the sino indian dispute what are the origins what are the implications what are the ramifications and then this should logically be followed by a china specific strategy which may or may not be public uh, public document but undertaking these exercises will help evolve accurate strategic assessments and will guide appropriate responses across the board and this this focus on the maritime domain which of this of which this seminar webinar is a, is a manifestation is, is, is a welcome step in that direction so we have to um, have to sort of make a, 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 an estimation of what's happening what is likely to happen what are the options available to us right uh, a word about our responses our responses so far in the last seven or eight months of this crisis have been reactive and have been limited by uh, one or two three considerations i would say first of all our main worry has been the management of escalation uh, what what we do with our armed forces will it escalate the situation from where it is now that's a very real um, real apprehension and it needs to be given due attention a second constraint has been the chances of a sino park nexus swinging into action that's again a very real possibility after all china and pakistan are are, are deeply involved with each other and this is a golden opportunity for them and the third constraint on us is the thought of the asymmetry that exists between india and china economic and uh, let's face the fact that our economy has been hard hit by the by the pandemic and a number of other factors so we, there's economic asymmetry there's military asymmetry there is technological asymmetry where china is now estimated to be 20 to 30 years ahead of us so these three considerations have possibly uh, affected our responses and in this context i think i should mention a very recent small micro conflict between azerbaijan and armenia our military needs to focus sharply on what happened in this conflict the role of technology and what were the outcomes right what are our options obviously common sense says there are two options kinetic and non kinetic kinetic is general war unthinkable i'm i'm sure neither china nor india would like a general all out war because its ramifications implications are unthinkable a limited conflict yes it is quite thinkable and if we focus our forces at at a given point in time we can certainly give china what is in 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 media parlance known as mutor jawab 
So limited conflict is a possibility and, and, and an option we should always keep. Alliances, um, certainly, we, this is where we need to muster our friends, convince them that there is a common cause in forming partnerships. And the maritime domain is once again very fertile. And as our uh, DGNO pointed out, uh, we are reaching out to our maritime friends, island uh, territories, and so on to form partnership because there is a common cause. And so these are the, and of course, uh, uh, military stalemate is what is ongoing now and what is possibly will, will prevail in the, in the near, near future. But um, if a military solution is not thinkable, then the only other uh, way out is negotiations. I mean, the military is supposed to stay in the shadows. It is the diplomats and the statesmen who are supposed to manage affairs of state. So it is indeed a commentary on statesmanship and our diplomacy that it has come to a pass where the military is now not only deployed, mobilized in strength, but also undertaking negotiations. It's a strange situation. So strategic patience is now the buzzword in South Block, I think. Uh, so, but we do need to engage China in very serious negotiations, perhaps at the summit level. And these negotiations, I mean, China has been dismissive of us all these years. We need to uh, persuade China and get the international community to persuade China that negotiations that take place now at the summit level between China and India should not only refer to territorial disputes and economic and trade relations, but also speak about spheres of influence between two large regional powers, nuclear confidence building measures, armed limitation talks, balance of powers, and such esoteric um, uh, topics need to be discussed at the apex level of China and India's um, uh, leadership to in order to meet the challenges that uh, China today presents to our interests. So with these few words, not few, but quite a few words of introduction, let me now <clears throat> call upon the our panel of very expert um, speakers. And to start with, I'll call upon, real, uh, forgive me for dispensing with detailed introductions, but I think this time is limited. And uh, we'd, we'd rather hear our uh, speakers than uh, read about them. So, so Air Vice Marshal Daus is available, then may I invite him to come on? Thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me okay? All right, so just a minute. So Air Vice Marshal Daus, doc, Dr. Andrew Daus is the Director of Defense Research in the Edith Cowan University of Australia. And he's very kindly accepted um, the invitation to speak here. And he's going to speak on challenges posed by China and provide us an Australian perspective. Over to you, Vice Marshal. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, admirals, generals, and distinguished participants. It's an honor for me to join this esteemed panel to discuss the dynamics in the Indian Ocean region, and in particular, Chinese challenges to India's interests. I'm going to speak from Australia's perspective. Uh, our circumstances are a little different to that of India's, but uh, nevertheless, I think of relevance. Since the turn of the century, Australia has significantly increased its economic relationship with China. This trade has been of mutual benefit, although iron ore exports provide a balance favourable to Australia. In recent years, critics have questioned whether Australia can maintain concurrently a strong trade relationship with China and a strong security relationship with the US, two nations who are involved in great power competition. Our relationship with China took a bad turn over the last six months with a series of trade decisions, which Chinese foreign spokesman Zhao Lijian characterized as measures needed to teach Australia a lesson. Now, this was the same spokesman who subsequently tweeted a fake image of an Australian soldier with a knife to a child's throat. China's trade decisions were attributed initially as a reaction to the Australian Prime Minister's call earlier this year for an independent review into the origin of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this was a reasonable request and at worst a minor provocation, but one that was received very badly by China. Clear communications are important and unfortunately our diplomatic relations with China have deteriorated to the point that since 2017 they've been conducted entirely through the media. The reasons for the breakdown in relations are complex and relate to events that began well before the pandemic. China's recently identified 14 grievances against China, including our criticism of Chinese core interests in Hong Kong, Taiwan and Xinjiang, 
our restrictions against Chinese investment, including the ban of Huawei from core networks, as well as investigations of political interference and espionage. Our unwanted interference as a perceived outsider in the South China Sea dispute, and our allegations of cyber attacks originating from China. Yes, Australia's done such things, arguably with justification, but so too have other nations. There's a widespread uh, view that this situation has less to do with Australia's actions, but more to do with the Chinese government setting an example to discourage other nations disrespecting or threatening China's rise as a world player or undermining President Xi's internal support base. To use a Chinese anecdote, they are killing the chicken to scare the monkey. Now, there's been errors on both sides, but I contend a miscalculation from the Chinese government. Their trade decisions have arguably hurt China financially more than they have Australia, with rising costs of the resource commodities they rely upon, and with many nations reconsidering their trade dependencies with China. Additionally, the situation has hardened the resolve of many nations, especially in relation to the use of Chinese suppliers in national telecommunications networks. At the moment, there's still a lot of rhetoric, but there's potential for things to get a lot worse. For example, our attempts to resolve disputes through international bodies such as the WTA will probably achieve little more than antagonizing China, and there is likely to be further escalation of the trade war. Secondly, Australia is proceeding with legislation to prevent foreign interference, including a ban on subnational bodies entering into foreign initiatives. We will develop stronger technical protections against influence and espionage, including from initiatives that have been described as the digital Silk Road. Australia will build resilience against ongoing cyber attacks attributed to Chinese advanced persistent threats, as well as to disinformation activities. There's going to be stronger security mechanisms to manage foreign influence on diaspora communities in Australia, especially in political parties and in academia. We expect China to respond badly to these measures as setting an example for other nations. Thirdly, there is great risk, but also great importance in our ongoing commitment to military maneuvers, such as freedom of navigation operations through the South China Sea and cooperative, and cooperative activities such, such as Exercise Malabar. FONOPS in particular carries a substantial risk of miscalculation. Fourthly, Australia may increase tensions by seeking to diversify our exports and manage our supply chain risks, with the latter being recommended by both our government's inquiry into the pandemic and a review of national critical infrastructure. And lastly, there is growing wariness about Chinese investments in the Southwest Pacific, such as the Daru port in PNG, and we will continue to counsel our neighbours accordingly. Such initiatives as Daru are a concern, both from the depth trap diplomacy perspective, as we saw in Han Bantoda in Sri Lanka, but also the potential of such a port eventually supporting military manoeuvre. I appreciate that while the relationship is tense, we have not experienced the conflict and the loss of life that India has in its northern border disputes. Yet we are in a deteriorated security environment, which this year led Australia to issue a defence strategic update. That update identified the increase in grey zone activities below the threshold of war, but also the increasing prospect of high intensity conflict with short warning. It re has resulted in a significant increase in our, Australia's defence spending, including on the development and acquisition of long range and hypersonic weapons. We continue to pursue diplomatic resolution. But the Australian government is resolute in not acceding to economic coercion and interference. Our governments will continue to deal with the bigger picture of trade and sovereignty, but those involved in defence are focused on working together to promote stability and to deter territorial expansionism, whether that be pressure on borders or the assurance of trade routes such as the South China Sea, a sea which carries around one third of global shipping. And we need to be prepared for such work to be contested. Strong partnerships will help to deter aggression partnerships such as the Quad. We may need to exercise care that such partnerships aren't seen as another form of containment that isolate China to the point at which conflict is inevitable. Partnerships between like-minded nations such as ours should be in the context of a mutual interest and not simply to an exclude another party. As much as we should work together towards a stable rules-based order, 
we should also seek to engage China towards the same peaceful ends. Sir, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marshal Daos, for that very succinct and clearly cut out. Um, I, I can see, we can all see that Australia is in, a, in an unenviable position right now. Uh, and of course, trade is a double-edged weapon. It can work both ways. So we don't know how, how well it will work for you, but it will certainly call for a lot of political resolve. And I, if I might say, there are some people who, who will derive a certain amount of schadenfreude from Australia's current position because given a past record, Mr. Kevin Rudd's position and so on, uh, some people are going to say, we told you so, but we wish you all the best. We are fighting in a common cause. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, Rear Admiral Michael McDevitt is, uh, uh, belongs to the Center for Naval Analysis. He's one of the founders of this institution, very uh, reputable institution. And um, I'll, I'll spare you the rest of it, but he's very recently written a book called China as a 21st Century Naval Power. And I strongly urge um, anyone interested in maritime power to get hold of this very penetrative and incisive book and very well written by Mike. So Mike, with that brief introduction, over to you. Uh, thank you again, Admiral, and I thank you for your very generous Much appreciated. Um, I thought uh, I would offer some thoughts on China's military presence in the Indian Ocean region. It's uh, interesting that almost exactly eight years ago, uh, today, is when the first uh, PLA Navy anti-piracy deployment to the Indian Ocean started. Since that time, they have maintained a continuous presence uh, Today, the 36th PLA Navy three-ship task group is on station in the Northern Arabian Sea. That, in, in, in fact, this task group includes two of China's newest ships, which is also one of the interesting facets of their deployments over the past eight years. Uh, they are not hesitant at all to put their newest commissioned ships online and send them off for a seven-month deployment. Uh, this continuous rhythm of deployments that have lasted on average somewhere around six months has acted as a blue water laboratory for the Navy, PLA Navy. And it allow, has allowed them to hone seamanship skills, logistics, under, underway replenishment, and uh, onboard repair, training, and essentially refine their basic operational standards on how to operate a ship a long way away from home uh, for a long period of time, which means that the crew, among others, has to be fairly proficient in maintaining those ships. And all this has taken place under the gaze of many of the world's uh, greatest navies. And as far as I can tell, the Chinese Navy has not embarrassed themselves operating under the microscope of uh, uh, in the Northern Arabian Sea of being watched closely by all by many of the world's great navies. The ships seem to be very reliable. Uh, they clearly have mastered logistics support. They've learned how to command and control a distant deployed force from Beijing uh, while giving the on-scene commander enough uh, operational uh, leeway to execute uh, uh, operations once they get permission from Beijing. They've demonstrated a, uh, an adeptness for naval deploy uh, diploma uh, diplomacy, uh, showing the flag. In fact, it has been until COVID uh, has curtailed many of the port visits, uh, They've, uh, at the end of their four or five month on station time in the Northern Arabian Sea, the groups have been dispatched to various places in the world uh, around the coasts of Africa, the Mediterranean, literal South Asia, uh, uh, the Antipods in Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific, and so forth on show the flag missions. Finally, the base at Djibouti has provided them with a combined logistics center 
a regional in, in intelligence node and what I would call the kernel of a regional naval headquarters. At the same time this eight, uh, during this eight years that has been going on, starting in 2005, uh, PLA Navy shipbuilding has taken off. Uh, and it shows no signs of abating. Uh, the, world, the, the PLA Navy is, in fact, the world's largest Navy. It is, in fact, much larger than the U.S. Navy. Uh, depending, uh, obviously, it depends on what you count. But using U.S. Navy counting rules, uh, the ship methodology is the U.S. Navy has around 297, uh, what they call, what we call, battle force ships in commission today. Whereas the PLA Navy has around 350 to 60 using the same counting rules uh, in commission. Now, I quickly add that 86 of those are, are uh, coastal patrol craft. Nonetheless, those coastal patrol craft are armed with anti-ship cruise missiles. Now, qualitatively, the U.S. Navy is is still superior and it still has a very large edge in tonnage, but in fact, uh, the PLA Navy is closing the tonnage gap as well as they continue to build uh, uh, larger uh, ships. For example, their new Type 55 uh, guided missile destroyer that, uh, uh, that uh, one is in commission now, but seven others are in various stages of uh, building, have been launched or are fitting out. Uh, these are all 13,000 to 14,000 full load displacement, displacement ships. The U.S. Navy wants to call them cruisers. The Chinese still call them destroyers, very large destroyers. But when you look at it all together, I would make the assertion that uh, by my calculations, the PLA Navy is in terms of at least ship count and ship capability. These are all well-armed ships. They, in fact, many of them are armed to the teeth. Uh, the PLA Navy is the second most uh, capable Navy in the world. Now, when it comes to the Indian Ocean, they do have one glaring shortfall, which Admiral Kosh, Prakash many years ago was quick to point out to me. They operate away from home in the Indian Ocean where they have no air cover. And India's geographic situation in the Indian Ocean provides them with great operational tactical and perhaps even strategic leverage with regard to the fact that when in, when Chinese ships, be they warships or merchants or Coast Guard or whatever happens to show up in the Indian Ocean, they are operating bereft of air cover. Uh, and so that that is not a problem they're going to solve very soon, even though they have two aircraft carriers in the water. Uh, they have the problem, of course, is they don't have very many J-15 uh, so-called flying sharks aircraft, uh, only 24, 25 in inventory, and so they can't even outfit uh, the air groups on both of those carriers. And so until they develop a really, truly capable carrier aircraft, uh, those, uh, those aircraft carriers that they have built are more of a show piece and a prestige uh, uh, platform as opposed to a, a, a serious war fighting capability. But the point is they're working on it. China also has DF-26 missiles would have an anti-ship capability that would reach well into the Indian Ocean. So I know that India in the past has been looking at whether China's A2 uh, concept could be expanded to the Indian Ocean. Well, they, they certainly have the weapons now. Uh, whether they have the surveillance that covers the Indian Ocean that can give them the accuracy to actually target those missiles remains to be seen. So because of time and trace, let me stop now and shift to things that I uh, see in the future. First, I think we're gonna, I, we're gonna see full-time PLA Navy submarine deployments. I know that they have been over the past few years, deploying submarines to the Indian Ocean for at least half the time. I suspect that those missions are, have fulfilled two roles. One, acclimate submarine crews to operating in, in Indian Ocean waters. And two, send a not so subtle signal to uh, New Delhi 
that in fact, while clearly they recognize India has the ability to interrupt China's sea lanes, China, with their submarine force in particular, has the ability to interrupt India's sea lanes, particularly the oil from the Persian Gulf or uh, East Africa to India. Second, I think we can assume that eventually we're going to see China take steps to solve the air cover problem. Whether that involves extending the little helicopter airfield in Djibouti uh, so that it can uh, you know, out to sea. I spoke to a, a, a scholar from Djibouti and said, could that, what, what can China do? And they said, well, they all have to do is build that short airfield they have out into the Indian Ocean, and they're very good at building, uh, filling uh, 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 the ground, uh, you know, dredging and building an airfield. And so we could either have uh, PLA Navy fighters in Djibouti, or more likely we're going to see PLA uh, aircraft carriers at some point uh, in a task group, uh, battle group, uh, somewhere in the Indian Ocean. And I think that they're uh, that Djibouti also is likely to become, over time, the headquarters for a deployed uh, Chinese uh, naval fleet, a number, what we would call a numbered fleet. And it goes without saying that the uh, Belt and Road construction uh, over the littoral of the Indian Ocean region provides port, port facilities around uh, uh, the littoral that are de facto access points for the PLA. So finally, a thought based upon the, the recent uh, shooting or killing going on on India's frontier with uh, uh, Tibet, with China, is should a full-scale war break out again or on the, show the prospect of breaking out again on India's northern frontier, it would seem to me that in, in the preparation leading up to, in case that looks like it's in, uh, something that could occur, it would be useful for India to engage the United States, perhaps they have, and I don't know about it, about gaining access to the U.S. facility at Dale Garcia to allow uh, Indian uh, aircraft and ships to use Diego Garcia in case they chose to interdict China's sea lanes. So I think uh, those that would play on uh, India's greatest strategic advantage. And with that, let me conclude my comments. Thank you. You're 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 muted, Admiral. Admiral, you're muted. Thank you, Mike. Uh, there couldn't have been anyone better than you to give us an uh, refresh our insight into the PLA Navy. And I'll just take three three or four points that you made to. Um, to my compatriots here, one is that one should never underestimate the adversary. We used to say that the Chinese don't know how to refuel from a beam. Uh, they are poor seamen. Uh, they can't go out and uh, into the wide open seas and so on. And they've proved it over the last 12 years that they can do anything that any other Navy can. Then uh, out came their first aircraft carrier and many of us predicted that they would uh, come to a sorry end. Uh, learning how to fly from an aircraft carrier is not a joke. Well, they lost a couple of aircraft, but they've learned the art. They're well into their second aircraft carrier becoming operating. So um, underestimating the uh, adversary is, is, is dangerous. Um, the third point is a rapid rate of production. They have produced an aircraft carrier in about three years or thereabouts. And they're turning out destroyers at the rate of uh, one every six months or so. Uh, that probably outstrips the USA and certainly far more than one can say about the Indian uh, shipbuilding industry. So I think we need to sit up and take note. Um, this air threat business, we can take uh, derive some satisfaction from it uh, for a few years more, but very soon I think we'll see a, a Chinese aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean. And then where do, where do we go? So to those who are opposing a third Indian aircraft carrier, I think <laughs> this is a point to take note. And even submarines, they have just supplied um, three yuan class submarines to Bangladesh. So what is to stop a PLA Navy submarine steaming up to, um, to Bangladesh one of these days for exercise? So I think there is need for extreme caution and vigilance out at sea. So thank you, Mike. I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions to answer. Um, we'll now move on to Lieutenant General Raj Rajeshwar. 
former uh, commander in chief of the Andaman Nicobar Joint Command, uh, one of my distinguished successors there. And General Rajeshwar is going to speak on uh, China and the Indian Ocean region, challenges or opportunities. Over to you, General. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ravi Thakar. My question is that with, an, with increasing in power and all other technologies, there are certain adverse effects on nature. Uh, what are the steps that are being uh, actually doesn't really contain to India's China uh, challenge? Environmental in, issues. Environmental issues, sir. Uh, then we have a question uh, with increasing power and all other technologies, there are certain adverse effects on India. Sorry. Uh, should you consider using underwater drones to tackle the increasing Chinese submarine threat to IUR? Uh, instead of investing in other costly technologies. Also that, sir. Yes, indeed. Uh, has the disturbance stopped? All right, this question about the underwater drone. Uh, Okay, this question about underwater drones is, is an interesting one. Certainly, we we uh, at least our um, navy must must enter this field of underwater drones. Um, it's in, in its early stages of development. Uh, underwater gliders are available, which 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 can endure for a long time, go to long distances. But underwater long range underwater vehicles are also under development. I believe that they can track submarines for days and months at end. Uh, so this is an arena that we do have to enter, but it is it will be in addition to other um, other um, anti-submarine uh, warfare capabilities, but will not be a substitute as far as I know. But perhaps I can ask um, Vice Marshal uh, Dows to comment on this. Thanks, Sarah. I, th I think it's an essential way forward, especially for underwater surveillance uh, to uh, uh, to develop underwater uh, uh, vehicle capabilities. And I think many uh, 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 national militaries, uh, uh, navies are uh, looking into that possibility. Thank you. Vinod, any other questions? Uh, can you possibly form new military bases with our friends? No, that, that I think we should leave it for the time being, sir. Uh, actually, there, there are a lot of questions on the technologies and underwater. Uh, there's another question. Considering China is going belligerent underwater or IU or to Pacific, does the Indian Navy have the technology for underwater operations? Uh, I suppose we have the technologies, uh, but there are certain challenges sir, and certain opportunities if the panel could take that on, sir. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Underwater domain awareness is as as is, is rapidly taking on um, importance. So far, we focused on maritime domain awareness, which has, which has uh, mainly been uh, directed towards satellites, uh, maritime reconnaissance, uh, coastal radar chains, and so on. But um, underwater domain awareness is going to be of great importance to us, especially with the increasing frequency of PL and Navy submarines making an entry into the Indian Ocean, including, uh, for all we know, um, SSB, which is the nuclear missile armed submarine. So it becomes essential for us to track and as far as possible to know the position of any intruding submarines in, in our general area of responsibility. Uh, tracking submarines is not an easy, easy task. Um, during the heyday of the Cold War, the superpowers had laid under a seabed arrays and gone to great lengths to ensure that uh, submarines were tracked, they were tracking each other's submarines. So perhaps, uh, if not by ourselves, but certainly in, in uh, cooperation with friends and partners, we can also look at laying some uh, 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 seabed arrays, especially at choke points like the Malacca Strait. Well, Malacca Strait is too, too heavily frequented, but there are other entry points into the Indian Ocean where we, we will have to, uh, to um, sort of take resort to laying underwater sensors are you making use of um, gliders and, and unmanned vehicles and so on? Uh, again, uh, any of the panelists wants to mic or uh, or um, uh, Marshall, would you like to take on this question? Uh, Admiral, I'll, I, the, certainly 
China has been spending a lot of time and effort on uh, trying to develop a whole range of uh, anti-submarine warfare technologies. I would just make the observation that uh, one of the problems that uh, has been identified in the U.S. Uh, with regard to any of these advanced technological uh, uh, potential solutions is it's easy enough for a company or a small group to uh, create a uh, an underwater vehicle, for example, that might do interesting things. Uh, the hard part is making the transition from a demonstrator or a, uh, a research and development project into into translating into something that can be produced uh, in numbers uh, and then deployed. Uh, and oftentimes uh, uh, there is this gap between uh, a good idea that seems to work uh, on a one-off and translating that into making that good idea work where you could outfit an entire Navy. Uh, and we, we, the United States, have not surma surmounted some of those basic problems ourselves. And so uh, uh, that I assume that that's a problem that both China and other countries that are working on trying to come up with exotic ways to track submarines. Thank you, Mike. Air Marshal? Uh, sir, uh, uh, Mike's uh, answer was a great one. I can't add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, General Rajeshwar is back. Once more into the breach, General. Uh, can I try again, sir? Yeah, certainly. Loud and clear. Welcome, welcome. Roger. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me over for, to speak on the subject, uh, challenge or opportunity. This, of course, depends on how uh, one views it. But I think as we go along, we can see what the possibilities are. Uh, first, the Chinese interest. Uh, that, that, that's well stated. 83% uh, of energy uh, resources from Africa, whether they are oil, cotton, manganese, cobalt for manufacturers, or uh, this 560 billion trade with Europe. All of which, uh, you know, makes uh, these slocks in the Indian Ocean region very important for them. Uh, and that is in addition to the traditional uh, literals of the Indian Ocean region who are trading already. Uh, and therefore, one understands the construct of the maritime silk route, which encompasses these Chinese interests, as they have stated. Uh, what about the presence in the Iowa? Uh, a lot has been said about it. A lot of activities since 2008. 36th uh, task force, uh, of course, anti-piracy. Uh, but overall, one understands it is gaining operational experience. Uh, what is intriguing is, of course, the type of uh, vessels, which range from surface ships, submarines, research vessels, and uh, basically for mapping and hydrography, and a lot of uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, craft. Uh, military base, uh, already you are seeing Djibouti as one. Uh, is Godar next? We don't know. Uh, uh, would there be anything else? Uh, of course, it, it's going to be interesting because uh, the CPEC and the CMEC, which is through Myanmar, they offer a lot of alternative possibilities. Uh, and of course, Chokfu uh, port, which uh, one is looking at. Right. Uh, military sales, already uh, the chief has alluded to the magnitude of military sales, especially to Pakistan, and uh, also in the form of submarines to Bangladesh and uh, other craft to Sri Lanka and Myanmar. Uh, what do we see? Uh, this is a comprehensive uh, linkage between traditional and non-traditional aspects. Uh, and that is what is, uh, you know, webbing around. It is predatory in nature. Long-term leases and long-term presence is what we see. What next? 
let's have a look at the PLA Navy. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it's rapid growth. Uh, what stands out is 350 ships today, uh, 420 apparently by 2030. Uh, they've added about eight times the ship what India has added in the last two decades. Uh, of course, uh, submarines are, are the next frontier. Uh, they've also got amphibious ships, which are huge in numbers, and the Marines are already getting a lot of uh, operational experience. Uh, today, maybe 20 or 1,000, but uh, may go to four to five times uh, by the end of the decade. Uh, what is more is uh, the roadmap laid out by the President Xi Jinping in 2017, which is underlined down below. And on to your right, you see the trilateral exercise, which they did in 2019 in the Western Indian uh, Ocean region. But what is more important is the niche capabilities, which is anti-ship cruise missiles, underwater drones, uh, you know, ships which are relaying submarine data into satellites, and so on. So I think uh, what uh, the maritime power ambitions are, uh, China is actually seeming to be ready to use any type of power to achieve any outcome. Next, please. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the right-hand uh, quote, which is by a seminal book by these two senior colonels about two decades back. And uh, if you uh, look at what uh, traditional uh, military, trans-military and non-military approaches are being formed, and especially to progress one's interests. Uh, so that is what compellence is all about. Uh, and, and this can manifest itself, if not now, maybe in the near future, especially uh, with the PLA Navy in its size. Okay, next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, what are the challenges? A bit of analysis and some prognosis. Uh, I visualize that uh, there will be increased act, you know, activities in the economic and security spheres. And China would like to consolidate its presence in the IOR. Uh, more uh, efforts to map, uh, foray deeper, greater plan operationalization, which I think the tipping point at some stage will be the appearance of the aircraft carrier uh, in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, more Chinese naval exercises, uh, multilateral or bilateral, uh, which also pose uh, destabilizing threats. Uh, increase in sales of military equipment, transformation of ports, today commercial, maybe tomorrow to a, to a large extent support or base, uh, collusivity with the CPEC, that is a big threat. Uh, Malacca dilemma, to my mind, will continue to stay. But what is uh, what we need to be wary of is this long-term dependency, especially with a lot of technologies which are uh, being given by the Chinese uh, to a lot of countries. And uh, what is worrisome is the miscalculation risks. That can happen anytime. And therefore, CBMs or confidence building measures will have to be put in place to, to, to in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, how does this intersect with Indo-Pacific construct? With more and more stakeholders, I think this is going to be a big issue. What about the Indian arm, India and its armed forces? Uh, uh, what are these opportunities that we are looking at? Uh, first, of course, I think we need to expand the scope of the Saga initiatives and both diplomatic uh, initiatives and military initiatives need to go uh, hand in hand. Uh, we need to sharpen the Act East policy. Therefore, there are a lot of effort uh, will have to be done here. Uh, especially with the littorals which abut the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea. Uh, if we aspire to become a net security provider in IOR, which uh, to a large extent we already are. Uh, on your right, you see uh, the nuts and bolts, basically bilateral and multilateral exercises, cooperate and pa partner with like-minded navies, so interoperability, uh, building faith and trust, Generating confidence in the Indian Ocean region, very important. And for that, we need to help build uh, other navies and Coast Guard capabilities. Uh, also, uh, 
now we need to augment the Indian Navy and joint services capabilities. Because if you are looking at the next 10 years, I think that is that is a very important part of it. Uh, next, please. As I come to the end, I, I draw your attention to what uh, Noah Harari said a couple of years back. Uh, the spectrum is vast. Uh, while we are looking at a rule based order in the uh, you know, Indian Ocean region, uh, we know that China is ready to use both economic and military power to its end. We need to remain vigilant for that. We've had a stable IOR in the past, but we need to be prepared to take on any challenges should they arise due to any clash of interests. Uh, thanks, sir. I'm done with that. Thank you, General Rajeshwar. I'm uh, glad you came back. Your presentation was certainly worth it. Thank you very much. Um, so can we uh, move on to the Q&A session now? Vinod, could you please uh, pick out suitable questions and put them out and we can, panel can take them on? Uh, sir, we don't, do not have any more questions from the participants, sir. Uh, but uh, one thing which uh, you know uh, bothers me uh, is the contest in the Indian Ocean region, uh, and uh, with the, the number of uh, warships there, uh, and the number of even uh, uh, commercial uh, shipping out there, uh, you know th there is always a possibility of uh, stupidity and things going wrong and a trigger, a spiral. Uh, so, uh, what can be done about it? It's a very, it's a very, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a uh, doubt which keeps creeping into my mind uh, because it just needs one, uh, one man uh, to go wrong, and uh, then you will have a, you know, a cascading effect, and it will into something very bad. Uh, it's a question for my, it's, a, it's an application which I have. So are you talking about the land domain sea, or where, where are you talking? What is the? I'm talking about the sea. Yes, yes, you're right. Out at sea. Out at sea. Well, I'm afraid, I mean, out at sea, the question of one man going uh, astray or doing something silly is far less than one man in a army picket or outpost <laughs> moving off a short volley. You know, on a ship or a submarine, it's a crew and there's a commanding officer and a captain who finally, the, the order to fire is always given by the commanding officer of the ship submarine aircraft. So, chances of things going wrong at sea are far less than chances of things going wrong wrong at on land where our troops are face face to face you know eyeball to eyeball uh, you know at some time tempers and, and the kind of confrontation that we've been having where uh, where pla uh, troops and our jawans have been pushing each other jostling pushing and i think it was a remarkable display of hope parents that in in, uh, in that uh, june 15th encounter both sides um, held back from opening fire it was a remarkable for human beings who were when your life is at risk, they held back, but it may not happen again. So I think the um, chances of something going wrong on land are far more than out at sea. Uh, there are a lot of um, safeguards in, in place on a ship or any naval unit. That is my, um, any of the other part, uh, panelists, Mike or um, Andrew Dows, please pitch in. I would just make the, make the observation that uh, the PLA Navy uh, has a dual command uh, situation uh, where you have uh, the commanding officer of the ship, but you also have the political uh, star, uh, who is uh, essentially it's called a dual command situation. And so, uh, in uh, in events that are that are not uh, imminent tactical things that people have to re respond to instantly. Uh, there is uh, a deliberative process that goes on about what what the ship might or might not go do, uh, and so uh, just so this this is uh, whether we like it or not uh, has is an effect uh, a, a two man control system on rash action on the part of an individual commanding officer of a Chinese Navy ship. Uh, and the one thing that we don't know for sure is how the Central Military Commission has finally uh, convinced themselves 
that it's uh, acceptable to allow an SSBN with warheads loaded on uh, on uh, uh, on the missiles to deploy, and have they in, put in place the sorts of two-man control and uh, permissive action links and all of the other systems that uh, other navies that have been uh, operating uh, uh, ships with intercontinental ballistic missiles on them to ensure that there is not uh, a, a rogue missile launch. Uh, as we know, uh, the Chinese have been very cautious about how they've handled their nuclear weapons uh, on their shore-based ballistic missiles. And so this is one of those great uncertainties that nobody knows for sure as to what procedures uh, have been put in place uh, for an SSBN that actually deploys uh, out of the direct uh, control except by periodic radio contact uh, with the Central Military Commission. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Anything else? We don't have any more questions. So may I, may I request you to give the concluding remarks, sir? I'll do that. Thank you. Right. So let's come back to the uh, theme of this session, which was to uh, for India to combat Chinese challenges to our, our interests. So as far as uh, the presentations go, it's quite obvious that uh, we have to take on China on all fronts. Literally, we have to be prepared. Um, economically, of course, we have to do whatever we can, but I think um, Dr. Dows made it quite obvious that even though Australia is determined to take on China in the economic field, it's not going to be easy. In, in the context of the USA, they say that how can the uh, Americans fight their own banker because China holds a huge number of uh, TT notes, whatever they're called. So uh, while we will all try and take on China in the economic field, it is not going to be easy because it can hurt the double-edged weapon, it can hurt both sides. So politically, as I mentioned, I mean, economically, as I mentioned, China is far ahead uh, and from economic strength comes military strength. They can build far more ships, destroyers, frigates, aircraft carriers than we can. Uh, and it'll be a long, long, hard tail chase for us to catch up. Um, this technology is the, is the key, actually, because China is Four to three generations ahead of us in technology. So whenever we, we speak of friends and allies and so on, and whenever we proudly declare that we bought twenty-two billion dollars billion dollars worth of U.S. hardware, uh, my heart sinks a little bit because is hardware is available anywhere: Israel, France, South Africa, UK. What we need is technology. We need to cross, take a huge technology jump so that we can get somewhere close to. America. So if anybody is our friend or ally, then we need to seek technology from them, not hardware. Hardware we need in any case. Um, an aspect that uh, General Rajeshwar brought out was the Chinese amphibious fleet, amphibious force, which is gathering strength. They're building this type 071 or 072 in large numbers. The Marine Corps started off from 20,000, and I think they're aiming for some 100,000 Marines. So what is the aim? Uh, one of the aims could be to uh, walk into one of the islands. We have 576 islands in the Bay of Bengal. Who's to say that uh, Galwan or Ladakh will, will not happen in our island territories? And we had the Indian Navy had, three, had planned to acquire three uh, LPDs, but the economic stringency, and we cancelled that program. So we need to be uh, beware on that that um, that front. Um, we have great plans. Sagar, Prime Minister enunciated the policy of Sagar, which is security and growth for all, act east, look, look east. Uh, all these hold out great promise. We also uh, have assumed the mantle of being a net security provider in the Indian Ocean region, at least perhaps later on in the Indo-Pacific. But uh, I think we are being a little over ambitious. Uh, Admiral McDevitt just told us how China is into its 36th uh, patrol in the Gulf of Aden, and they are maintaining. They are sending brand new ships on a on a long range deployment. That speaks a huge amount for their industrial infrastructure, their ability to support a brand new ship. You know that on a ship which has a, a, a thousand different systems working at the same time, a, a seal breaks down, 
a radar magnetron gives way or any small component can break down at any time so if you can if you cannot support your fleet out at sea through your industrial um, base then you are really uh, not able to provide net security to anyone including yourself so these are the things that i think we in india need to look at uh, look at our economy you have to pick it up by, the, by its bootstraps put it back where it was and from the economy move on to technology industry and then move on to boosting our uh, military strength that's the only way and it will take time so in the interim what do we do how do we hold off china uh, mike with david made a very interesting suggestion that we should seek the use of um, of digo garcia uh, by indian aircraft possibly it's an interesting suggestion it will expand the range of our maritime surveillance um, hello a lot we should seek it whether usa the us congress etc will permit it i am not too sure um, the us is also uh, the, the secretary navy the current one breaks weight has said that they are thinking of establishing or setting up a new first fleet headquartered in singapore uh, now that's going to be a mixed blessing because if the us sets up a new first numbered fleet in the indian ocean china is going to respond what is to stop a chinese pla navy squadron being based in uh, jabuti or guadar or somewhere so we have to if we if we need 7 or 10 years to build up our strength consolidate ourselves we need some friends and allies and um, allies we we we've, we've, we've um, been very chary of striking alliances etc but let me go back to 1971 when in spite of being non aligned in spite of strategic autonomy we signed a treaty with the ussr uh, it did no harm to us it caused through a difficult war it did no damage to our image so um, 50 years later uh, it will be an exercise of our strategic autonomy in 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 the supreme national interest if we were to sign on the dotted line and sign a treaty with some unnamed country which will see us through the next 8 or 10 years till we are able to stand up to china or other treaties are time limited and always signed in self interest so with these concluding remarks let me thank uh, the, the four panelists for their very valuable and useful contribution to this Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your concluding remarks. Uh, before I hand over to General Ravi Arora for the word of thanks uh, from my on behalf of everyone uh, out here, a special thanks uh, to our uh, eminent speakers from uh, the U.S., Australia, Indonesia, uh, 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 Admiral Michael. It's one thirty in the morning in Washington. Thank you very much for being there, uh, uh, Marshal House and uh, Admiral. Amarola, thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, over to General Ravi Roda for the word of thanks. Before Ravi, may I make a, a quick remark on our um, technology? Uh, Not we got Sorry. still clear pictures from Australia from the US in the middle of the night, but right next door is having problems with South Block. We need to look at. Uh, so I think we, we, I think there's been some problem today. Other normally we do not have. We conduct a number of webinars. Uh, it's okay. a rare one. I think some. Uh, I hope Ravi Ravi didn't share this password with Beijing. <laughs> I hope not. So, well, by the way, so we had a we had a uh, cyber bomb in one of our webinars. Uh, it's not that we didn't have one. Possible, yeah. We didn't, possible. We, didn't have, we don't know, but we had one you know, in one of our webinars. Uh, old General Ras. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the qualifications that I have for being here is that I have served under Admiral Arun Prakash uh, when he was appointed Sinkan, and I was the brigade commander there. and before that i was the secretary of the joint planning committee that is made up of the three services dgmos uh, and with that experience i can say this uh, short 3 hours webinar has brought together people uh, from the um, malabar excise and from uh, if the japanese uh, invitee had accepted we would have had representation from the quad also so this brought together the indian navy the indian army the indonesian navy and the royal australian air force and the us navy uh and uh, this privilege has been given to me to on behalf of st jos and imr to thank the uh ministry of defense government of india specifically the department of defense production at whose instance this webinar was organized uh by army headquarters and sinjos 
I'd like to thank the esteemed speakers and the participants. And there are some people and entities that I must thank particularly. One is uh, Admiral Arun Prakash himself for having suggested that we get a speaker from Indonesia and having suggested Admiral McDevitt's name. Uh, also, the uh, CISC, Chief of Integrated Defense Staff, uh, for having approved this webinar and given valuable suggestions to the ADG Army Design Bureau for his tremendous support, to the Defense Advisor in Jakarta for his help, to APSI New Zealand for having suggested uh, Air Vice Marshal Dr. Dowse's name. Uh, and of course, special thanks, as um, General Bhatia also mentioned, to our foreign guest speakers for having joined us at inconvenient timings. Uh, this uh, webinar has been cast live on YouTube as well, but the proceedings of this webinar will be edited, annotated, and also put up on YouTube in the next two, three days. Once again, thank you all very much. Jai Hind.